Thank you for coming. My name is Corey Waters. This is Vegan Series. Vegan Series is a speaker series that seeks to stimulate interactions about veganism and about social justice. Um, I conduct Vegan Series through Animal Activists of Philly and the Temple Vegan Action Network, or TVAN. You can learn more about Animal Activists of Philly by joining our meetup group at meetup.com um, or by liking our Facebook page. Um, we have several sustained campaigns. Um, including a campaign called It's Not Food, It's Violence. Um, this is a campaign that has been targeting Chipotle, which um, constructs and reconstructs um, the notion of happy meat, which is a topic I suspect our guests will be addressing tonight at some point. Um, so um, that's Animal Activists of Philly. The next action for that particular campaign is March 29th. Um, you can learn more about TVAN by joining our listserv um, by uh, liking our Facebook page or by um, coming to our meetings. Um, if you want to advocate veganism on this campus, um, if you want to try veganism, TVN is an ideal network for you. Um, tomorrow we have a bake sale from 9 to 4 in Tyler. So if you're on this campus and you are hungry tomorrow, um, come check us out um, and feed yourself. Um, so, if you're interested in learning more about Animal Access of Philly or TVAN, touch base with me tonight and I will inform you of everything you need to know. Um, the next Vegan Series event is on April 14th, and that event will be a panel on intersectionality. Um, our panelists will be Ed Coffin from Peace Advocacy Network, um, Desiree Malonis from Temple, and um, AJ Young from Temple. Um, tonight we have treats from Grindcore House. Grindcore is a vegan coffee house in South Philadelphia on 4th Street between Dickinson and Tasker. Um, Grindcore is one of my favorite places. Um, if you've never been there, check it out. Highly recommend it. Um, the treats tonight were um, funded by Veg Fund. Veg Fund has consistently supported this series, and for that I am very grateful. Um, well, for vegan advocates and animal rights activists in the audience, our guest tonight needs no introduction. Um, this is Gary L. Francione, professor of law at Rutgers School of Law in Newark. Uh, professor Francione has been teaching animal rights theory and law for three decades. He has published numerous articles and books, including the book for sale tonight. Um, that book is Eat Like You Care, an examination of the morality of eating animals, co-authored with Anna Charlton, professor of uh, law at Rutgers as well. Um, and that book is published on, on Exemplar Press. Um, his body work also includes one of my favorites, um, a book entitled The Animal Rights Debate, Abolition or Regulation, co-authored with Robert Garner and published by Columbia. Um, the whole book is a very productive debate, very revealing debate uh, between the two authors, so I recommend that one. Um, you can learn more about Professor Francione and about veganism on his website, abolitionistapproach.com. Um, so how tonight is going to work? Uh, Professor Francione is going to talk about 45 minutes, then a discussion involving you and your comments and your questions will commence. All right, Professor Francione. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us tonight. And you know, when I saw, it, it reminds me, um, we're having a conference at uh, Rutgers Newark on the 11th of April. It is free. Um, it is a one-day conference on Friday, uh, April 11th, and it's it, it going to be we're going to be speaking um, as will Will Kimlicka and Sue Donaldson, who wrote Zoopolis, uh, Gary Steiner, who uh, has written several books on animal ethics, um, and oh, and David Nybert, who has written some uh, some uh, sociologist uh, who's written some terrific stuff on animals, and we're going to be talking about uh, the fact that. We are, you know, we're facing a crisis. I mean, we've got all this animal welfare stuff going on. We've had it going on forever. And we're still exploiting more animals today in more horrific ways than at any point in human history. And so what do we do? You know, do we, do we, how do, do we, how do we change what we've been doing? Because what we've been doing hasn't been working. And so we're going to be talking about, oh, and by, uh, Louis Chesa uh, from Buffalo is coming. Um, and, and Sharon Cole, yes, I can't, I'm, just, you know, I'm sorry, I'm getting old, I forget things. Um, and um, yeah, Sherry Cole and Michael Dorff from Cornell. So it's going to be a really, I think, interesting sort of debate. Um, you know, we're going to each give presentations and then we're going to interact with the audience. 
Um, and um, you know, we um, we opened it up for registration a week ago. We've already got 125 people. So, but you know, um, we've got we changed rooms now. We're going to have a different room, uh, and we encourage everybody to come. It should be really interesting because you know, Will Kime Lick and Sue Donaldson wrote this book called Zoopolis, in which they talk about the citizenship of animals. Um, you know, and we have views on that. And, you know, there are people like Louis Chaisa is the defender of uh, welfare regulation. Um, Michael uh, uh, Dorf and Sherry Cole um, are going to be talking about some law-related subjects. Uh, Gary Steiner is a philosophy professor from Bucknell. So it should be a really interesting day if you want to come. Um, and you can register. You can go to the Facebook site, Abolitionist Approach, uh, the Abolitionist Approach to Animal Rights, and it'll take you to the, the Rutgers site where, you, where you, you register. And as I said, it's free. Um, Tonight, you know, you never know with a group like this what people want to talk about. So we're going to like go through some stuff. Um, and if it's not stuff you, I mean, you know, you may want to talk about something else, and that's fine. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, um, we'll probably open it up for discussion sooner rather than later. Um, when Corey originally asked, uh, asked us to come, we thought, well, the good, a good thing to do would be to talk about the new book, um, which, which we wrote. It was one of these things where, you know, we were trying to think, how do you discuss, I mean, it's one thing when you're talking about this with a bunch of animal people. Um, you know, you have a, a, one sort of conversation. But things are never going to change. The paradigm is never going to shift as long as we're talking to animal people. We need to be talking to members of the public. And, and we need to, dis to be dispelling the idea that there's anything extreme or crazy um, I, I don't want to say not radical, because I do believe it is radical in the sense of it gets to the roots of speciesism, which is related to racism, sexism, heterosexism, and other forms of discrimination, as I think you'll be hearing um, at your next, uh, the next meeting of this group. But, um, I, you, you know, so I do think it, veganism gets to that, but, but there's this idea that this is a really crazy, radical idea, and, and that, um, you know, and what, what we wanted to do is sort of dispel the idea and, and explain to people how, for the most part, these are things, the ideas that we express, and the ideas that can get us to veganism clearly, are things that most of us already believe. And that's the sort of approach that we're using in, 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 in writing this, because we wanted it to be something that somebody who's concerned about animals, somebody who cares about, we, 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 were, we were targeting two audiences. One was people who care about animals um, but don't know exactly how to sort of think through, through the, the, the issues and what conclusion they want to come to. And what we do with this book is basically say, look, if you care about animals, you're, you're, you're stuck. You are obligated to stop eating them. Okay? Um, and, you know, that's it. It's not a question. You, you, you either stop consuming them or you continue to participate in animal exploitation. There ain't no third choice, okay? And so we wanted to sort of get that idea across to people, um, you know, who are sort of don't know really what they think about the issue. And the second group that we were targeting are people who are vegans, but who don't really know how to educate. You know, we get tons and tons and tons and tons of emails, um, about 300 a day, and I would say at least a hundred of those emails are, how do I talk to my, my, you know, my mother, my father, my sister, my brother, my lover, my spouse, you know, whatever, uh, you know, to talk about, to get these ideas across, you know, particularly in situations where there's tension, where you've got a couple, and, you know, one's a vegan and one isn't, and this is becoming an issue. And so we wanted to write this to try to get people to, to focus in on, on how they can educate others. So that's really um, what the idea was. And so we started off with, with this idea that, look, everybody agrees, everybody in the world agrees with the, two, with the, the, the conventional, our conventional wisdom about animals comprises two principles. One is animals matter, but they don't matter morally as much as humans do. Now, we make the point, we say, look, we think that that's we think that a really good argument can be made. Um, that that's, that's, a, that's a really problematic moral principle. But you know what? You don't have to accept that for the purposes, for any purpose, 
um, uh, animals and uh, humans and non-humans are equal. All you need to, you know, you, you believe that animals matter morally. They're not things. They are members of the moral community. They may not have the same standing or the same, the same value that humans have, but we think that animals matter. There are very few people like Rene Descartes who said, well, they don't matter. They're outside the moral community. They're automatons. They blah, 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 blah. There are very few people. Well, that, that strikes us every time. We, we teach a course together at Rutgers, an ethics course, I know, in a law school, what we do. Um, and cover a whole range of issues. And there will be a variety of different opinions on almost any ethical issue, whether it's capital punishment, abortion, affirmative action, gay marriage, anything. I could get consensus in almost any room and I could probably get consensus if I went out on the street tonight and asked the same question, how do you feel about cruelty to animals? Or should we be kind to animals? The class would be very short if that was the extent of the, of the um, answer that I was looking for, because it's always yes. Have you ever met anyone who doesn't think that they should be kind to animals? Who doesn't recoil if they hear of, of an abusive situation? I don't think I've ever met and I've never met them amongst communities of hunters, people who use animals in biomedical research, people who eat animals. So there's this dissonance. We have this idea that animals matter, or else we wouldn't have that reaction, no matter how teased out it is into a real framework, in terms of an ethical um, framework. But it's that reaction. We're reacting to something. You shouldn't be cruel to animals. So where does that come from, and where does it take us? And that's one of the reasons that we did a short book for a more general audience. She wouldn't let me put like, you know, I had like no eight, footnotes. eight million <laughs> footnotes, and she said, no, no, we're not doing that in this one. Um, and so, uh, but, but these two principles, this idea that animals matter, but they don't matter as much as humans do, and that in situations of conflict, in situations of real conflict, humans win. That is, I think, part of conventional wisdom. I don't think that really can be defended. As a matter of fact, much of my other work sort of goes to deconstructing that and showing that I don't think that that's defensible. But it's part of conventional wisdom. And you don't have to go any further than if you believe that animals matter, that they matter morally, they're not things, they are members of the moral community. Okay? That's all I need you to, that's, that's all we need. The second part of conventional wisdom is what Anna was just referring to, the idea that we have an obligation not to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals. So in situations of conflict between humans and non-humans, humans win. But we have a moral obligation that we owe directly to animals. It's not, a, it's not a question of owing it to anybody. It's a question of we owe a moral obligation directly to animals not to inflict unnecessary suffering on them. Okay? Now, I would, su I would suggest that... Those are two principles that everybody I know accepts. There may be some people who say, well, you know, I go further. I say that, you know, that, that, you know, I'll agree with you on your arguments about equality and whatnot. But yes, fine. But, and, 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 and I like that. I like hearing that. However, you don't have to, to go that far. If, if you just take our conventional wisdom with its two pieces, that, that animals matter, but they don't matter as much as, as, as humans do. And then in situations of compulsion, conflict, okay, um, animals lose, humans win. In situations of real conflict. The other part of the conventional wisdom is that we shouldn't inflict unnecessary suffering on them. Okay? What we do in the book is to say, if you accept those two principles, you're stuck. Got to stop eating all that stuff. We don't get into wearing animals, or you, we just talk about food, because basically, as long as people are eating them, nothing changes. Once they, once they stop eating them for ethical reasons, then everything changes. You know? And, and you know, we, don't, we also discuss the fact that there's no moral distinction between flesh and other dairy products. You know, this idea that, you know, today is Monday, as Corey refer, you know, Corey sort of welcomed me and said, it's Meatless Monday, and he knew that um, that, that would upset me. Uh, because I think that that's nonsense. Promoting the idea to people that 
flesh is morally distinguishable from dairy and eggs and stuff is ridiculous. I mean, you know, animals used for dairy, for example, live longer. They're treated every bit as badly as the animals used for meat, and they all end up in the same slaughterhouse anyway. And frankly, if you go from eating a lot of beef and pork to, and you say, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go veg. I hate that word. Um, I'm going to go veg. Um, and you start ramping up on the eggs, you may actually be responsible for more animal deaths because the, the you know, eggs have, have, next to chicken, the highest number of deaths per thousand calories. So, you know, so, but we, what we try, so what we try to do is to say, look, if you, if you buy into these two principles, these two pieces of conventional wisdom, that animals matter, but they don't matter as much as humans, and that we have an obligation not to inflict unnecessary suffering on them, you are stuck. If you, uh, you, you, you can be a hypocrite if you want and say, well, you know, I believe these things, but I don't really, you know, I'm a moral eunuch and I don't really sort of act on my moral principle. Yeah, you can do that too. But if you take morality seriously and if you really believe what you say you believe, you are obligated to stop consuming animals. You are, and, and not just meat, but meat and dairy and butter and cheese and all that stuff and honey and all that sort of stuff, you're obligated to stop consuming it. And so that's what we, what we, uh, uh, the focus of the book, as it were. And then we talk about Michael Vick. Michael Vick, for me, is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, you know, Michael Vick, in 2007, when Michael Vick was arrested, and uh, for because he was running a dog fighting operation, and um, and I remember, you know, sort of like O.J. Simpson, it was this perverse, and I think in certain ways motivated by racism, I really do. Uh, I know animal people get upset every time I say that, and I don't care, because I really, I really <laughs> sincerely believe that, that, there's, that, there's, that the, the Vic situation stinks of racism in, in many ways. Um, and, uh, but you know, I, I was, it was constant, that summer of 2007, it was relentless, Michael Vick is evil, Michael Vick is terrible, Michael Vick is evil. And so I sat down and I wrote this essay, called We're All Michael Vick. And in the essay, what I did was to say, look, what this guy did was terrible. And why was it terrible? It was terrible because what he did was he inflicted suffering and death on these animals and he had no good reason. The only reason he had was that he enjoyed watching this activity. And we think that it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals. And whatever, we can have an interesting philosophical discussion about what necessity means. But whatever it means, it means we can't inflict suffering for reasons of pleasure, amusement, or convenience. So that's why we get angry with Michael Vick. And you know what? Everybody, I mean, they're still angry. It's 2014. The guy, try, you know, he can't show up at any public venue without having petitions to try to get him away from, you know, out of the venue, without having animal people protesting, etc. This guy is still the target of an enormous amount of hatred because he inflicted suffering and death on animals, and he did so for the sole purpose. He got pleasure from it, and we believe ubiquitously, pervasively, unequivocally, that that's, there's something morally odious about that because we're inflicting suffering and death on animals, for reasons of pleasure, amusement, that doesn't count. That can't count. If you believe it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals, then you have got to accept as a logical matter that we cannot, that, 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 that pleasure or amusement or convenience cannot suffice for necessity. Because think about it, if we say, well, you know, I think it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on children, but you know, occasionally I like to torture them because I like to listen to them scream. I get pleasure from that. You would say, well, you've now just created an exception which is so large that you could drive a truck through it. And so, so this is why we get upset with Michael Vick. But then why, how, what's our standing, what, how do we make sense of that? Because we're killing 58 billion animals a year, worldwide, 58 billion, billions of thousand million, and probably, nobody knows the number for fish, but a conservative number is a, is a trillion. That's, that's, the, that's the, the most conservative number I've seen. A trillion is a million million. So what we're doing is we're killing zillions of animals every year, inflicting suffering and death on them. What's our justification? We don't need to eat animal products. I mean, we've both been vegans for 32 years. You think it was, you think, you think it's difficult now. You should have seen 32 years ago. Um, but but um, um, I'm looking for this great quote, um, which I have, oh, here it is. Um, nobody, not even the prime disseminator, 
of disinformation on planet Earth, the United States government, maintained that you need to eat animal products to be healthy. You don't. Simply, it's simply not, not the case. The extremely conservative Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, formerly the American Dietetic Association, this is a quote, it is the position of the American Dietetic Association that appropriately planned vegetarian diets, including total vegetarian or vegan diets, are healthful, nutritionally adequate, and may provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. Well-planned vegetarian diets are appropriate for individuals during all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, infancy childhood, and adolescence, and for athletes. Okay? So we don't need to eat animal products to be optimally healthy. Animal products are an eco, constitute an ecological disaster. It takes between 6 and 12 pounds of plant protein to produce a pound of flesh for cows. You know, it takes about 3 pounds with chickens. You know, you're, using, you're using tons times more water to produce a pound of flesh than a, a pound of wheat or a pound of potatoes. I mean, it's an ecological disaster. The, the next, the largest single source of greenhouse gases is animal agriculture more so than burning petroleum for transport? I mean, so we don't need to eat animals to be healthy. Okay? Moreover, it's an ecological disaster. It's not that it's like doing something good for the planet, it's destroying the planet. The best justification we have for inflicting pain, suffering, and death that goes well beyond. You know, let me tell you something. The animals you eat tonight, if any of you eat animals, the animals you eat tonight will have had a worse life and a, probably a worse death than Michael Vick's dogs. And I'm not defending what Michael Vick did. What I'm saying is there is nothing different about sitting around a pit and watching dogs fight and sitting around a barbecue pit when you're out there on the main line, you know, roasting the corpses of animals that have had lives and deaths every bit as bad as Vick's dogs. And the best justification we have, they taste good. So you tell me, because I'm, I'm not asking this, I'm not asking this, you know, because, I mean, I'm not asking, I'm not asking this polemically. Well, I guess I am sort of, but, um, but I mean, because I, I really don't have an answer for this. Maybe one of you can give me one. And what the hell is the difference between what Michael Vick did and what anybody does who ain't a vegan? Tell me, because I don't understand it. Now, you know, the, the usual response I get is people say, well, you know, he, he did it. He did it himself, you know? So what? I teach criminal law. One of the first things you teach people in criminal law is if I kill you, if I, if I kill you, or I hire somebody else to kill you, it's murder. In both cases, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether I kill you myself or whether I hire somebody and say, you know what, I'm squeamish, you know, I, I, I really don't want to do this, you know, could you please do this for me? I'll pay you, you know? And, 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 and I pay you to kill somebody. That's murder. Okay? As a matter of fact, there are scenarios in which, in, which, in which it might even be worse than if you do it yourself, depending on the state of mind you have when you do it yourself. You might actually have less legal culpability than, um, than somebody who, who, who pays money and hires somebody to be a, a paid assassin. So the fact that Michael Vick, there may be a psychological difference, you know, Michael Vick, you know, sitting, sitting there watching these dogs fight and enjoying this. They're making, that's psycho, I mean, it's sort of a creepy thing. I mean, sort of a, it's, a, it's an, uh, it, troubling that somebody, like, looks at this and enjoys it. But, you know, and morally, it ain't no different from going to the Acme or, or whatever supermarket you shop at and buying these things in plastic packages. You know, there's absolutely no difference. And so, so that's, 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 where we sort of came out on the book was like, you know, look, Michael Vick, there's really no difference between Michael Vick and the rest of us. And actually, when I wrote that editorial in 2007, I, um, I sent it to the Philadelphia Daily News because, you know, I, 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 I sent it to the Philadelphia Daily News. And because uh, I knew the Inquirer was, you know, it was, it was an in your face sort of thing. Inquirer. So, so I sent it to the Daily News and I got a call very quickly and they said, we'll take it. And I said, um, fine, but you can't change anything. And, and they said, fine. They said, you know, it's long, but we'll, we'll run it. And they ran it. And within a week, um, my, my email um, inbox uh, became dysfunctional because uh, there were like, 
there was a zillion, I mean, there was like 1,500, I mean, it was just incredible. And it was interesting, it was evenly divided. It was like people, a lot of people said, you know, I never thought about it this way. Um, and this is really provocative and interesting. And then there were like a lot of these people who said, you know, I wish you were dead. You know, because they were really upset that I was analogizing him to Michael Vick. Although I never really understood, you know, they said, you know, he was a monster, he's a monster. But, you know, it's, it, the whole, the Vick thing, which is going to be the subject that I'm going to write, I'd like to write a book about the whole Michael Vick thing, because I think it sort of raises really interesting issues about lots of different, you know, about racism, about speciesism, about the connection between the two, about, you know, the animal rights movement, such as it is. Um, and, and, um, uh, and, and it's a fascinating case, but you know, the guy, it's, it's 2014, right? He's gone to jail, he didn't go to jail for the dog fight, he went to jail for tax evasion and, and, and other stuff, but, but he did go to jail. I don't know any non-vegans that, you know, I mean, I don't know any non-vegans who have been put in jail just because they're not vegans. I mean, you know, it, 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 this guy went to jail, he's come out, he's, he criticizes dog fighting, and people still hate him. You know, they still hate him. And, and, you know, when he signed with the Eagles, I was, the day that he signed, signed with the Eagles, I'm at a gas station, and, and um, it was one of these things where, you know, the, the, you know, these gas stations now, like a lot of them have these, like, you can't get away from, like, talking heads, you know, you're, you're trying to, you know, you're filling your car, there's like a screen, and it's talking to you, and it's advertising things, bye, bye, capitalism, and, and, um, and so, so th there's this talking head, and the talking head is talking about Michael Vick, and, and the guy on the other side of the island, he says, um, what do you think about Vic signing with the Eagles? And I said, um, I said, uh, well, I said, uh, sort of interesting. And he said, you know, I'm a big Eagles fan, but I don't think I'm ever going to be able to go to a game again. Because every time I look at that son of a bitch, I'm going to think about what he did to those dogs. And it just makes my stomach turn. And I said, uh, yeah, I can understand. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, um, when you're sitting there watching the Eagles game, what do you eat? Do you eat hot dogs and hamburgers and stuff? And he like, looked at me and said, well, what sort of question? I said, no, no, I'm, I'm just asking. <laughs> and, 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 and he said, um, he said, well, yeah. He said, you know, I, you know, I love, you know, I guess he gets these I don't know what, you know, I, I, I will tell you, I've never been to a football game my entire life. Um, so I don't really know what they serve, um, what they serve when the Eagles play, or indeed what any football team. I suspect it's a lot of meat and stuff like that. So he was talking about something that he likes to eat when he watches these games. And I said, you know, I said, um, do you ever stop to think that those animals that you're eating, you know, or, or the fact that, you know, the ball these guys are throwing around, you know, it was made from an animal skin, or they're all wearing leather stuff, you know, and, and all of those animals, like, really hard, had horrible lives and horrible deaths. I don't know if you have people who have ever been to a slaughterhouse. I've been to tons of them. And you know what? I've seen the good ones, the bad ones, the Temple Grandin approved, all of these, you know, these, these, these slaughterhouses. And you know what? I never saw a good one. I never saw one where I said, gee, you know, that's not bad. I wouldn't mind ending up there, you know? I mean, these are really hideous, horrible, monstrous places, evil places. And I use that, I, I, I mean, you know, I'm not using that. I, no, I'm using that, it's either evil places. Um, and, and this idea that, like, you know, Mike Vick, wow, man, bad guy. We can't, we, you know, we're, we're too upset to sit and watch him play football while we're sitting eating our cows, our pigs, our chickens, who have ended, who have had lives in which they've been tortured. The animals that we consume, under the best circumstances, have been subjected to treatment where if we were talking about humans, it'd be a no-brainer, it's torture. And there ain't no good slaughterhouse, none, not one. You know? And so, so this is really what we focus on in the book. And we try to get, you know, we give different examples. We give, we give an example from Britain because, you know, she's British and we just felt, you know, like, Sort of, you know, I, had, I had, actually had to, but um, uh, but we gave a, you know we gave a, a, a case in Britain where you know a woman's walking down the street and she takes a cat. She's on she's on, on a video, you know, because the, the video is all over Britain. He said, and so this woman's walking down the street and she takes a cat. And she throws a cat in a, gar in, a, in a trash bin. The cat wasn't killed, but the cat was in the bin for you know several hours, and the cat freaked out. And the cat was really upset, and this woman was like vilified. She was compared to Adolf Hitler. She was I mean it was just complete hate. Why? Because she inflicted suffering on an animal and had no good reason. 
And then we talk about some other examples. But the bottom line is, is we all respond the same way. We respond to cases like that. We respond to Michael Vick. We respond this way because we see something is wrong there. We see that there's something inherently wrong about subjecting an animal, a sentient being, somebody who is subjectively aware, perceptually aware. That's what I mean by sentient, so, you know, to be subjectively aware, to be the subject of, of, of awareness on some level. Um, that a, 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 a sentient being has been made to suffer and or die for no good reason. And pleasure and convenience and amusement don't count as good reasons. So the bottom line is, you know, yeah, if you're on a desert island, you know, because this is what I always get. What if I'm on a desert island? Well, you're not. You're here in Fifth Temple. Right? But, but if you were at a desert island and you were in a situation of compulsion where either you were going to die or you had to kill an animal and eat the animal, my view is I still don't think, I, I think that that might be morally excusable. I don't think it's justified. I, think, I don't think killing is ever justifiable unless it's maybe self-defense or something. But, but um, or, or, or in a situation of euthanasia, if, if an animal, you know, but again, you know, I think that that's perfectly fine with humans as well. Um, but, but um, you know, in a situation of compulsion where you don't have a choice, you know, there, have been, there are lots of law cases. As a matter of fact, the first case in the case book that I use, as a matter of fact, I think it's like the first case in every case book in criminal law is, do you use that when yours was, okay, um, and, um, is a case where these guys are on a, on a small boat and um, they're in the middle of the ocean and they've been stranded for like weeks and they kill, you know, there's four guys and one of the guys had drunk seawater and, um, and he got really sick and uh, so they thought, well, he's going to die anyway. So they killed him and they ate him. And, um, and you know, and there are a bunch of these, these cannibalism cases where people are in these, you know, these weird situations. And they, you know, they kill people and they eat people or they, you know, they eat, you know, they, they do it. And, um, and generally, you know, we don't sort of say, well, you know, that's okay. We don't, we say, look, we think it's wrong, but we understand why people do it. As a matter of fact, in that particular case, um, uh, the Queen versus Dudley and Stevens, uh, these guys were convicted and sentenced to death for what because they were rescued eventually, and um, actually they, nobody knew what, what happened was good good lesson about alcohol. Um, <laughs> they got away with it. They get they get rescued. They got away with it, but they're in a pub and they're drunk and they're talking one night about eating Parker and and you know and one thing leads to another and they get tried and convicted and so they're sentenced to death and Queen Victoria um, uh, commutes the sentence because you know I mean. To six months, basically. They served six months and she commuted the sentence. Because, you know, look, when someone's in a situation like that, when they haven't eaten for three weeks, um, and they haven't had any water in three weeks, except the guy who had drunk it and was dying, um, uh, you know, they, 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 they killed this guy. And they actually, they, they, it was not so much eating him, it was drinking his blood. They needed to get the, the fluids. And so, so, you know, there are six, and look, you know, if you're on a desert island, and there's like no vegetables, you know, and you and I are on a desert island, and I'm starving to death, I haven't eaten in four weeks, and there are no vegetables around, absolutely no plant matter, you know, is it okay for me to kill a rabbit? I got news for you, I'd kill you and eat you, but that wouldn't mean it's okay, it just means it's like what you do in situations like that. But the bottom line is nobody, 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 nobody in this room is in that position, okay, and, and so, Tonight, when you're deciding what to, what to eat, there ain't no conflict situation. You know, you're not in a situation where like, oh, there's a conflict and I have to decide whose interests weigh more. No. It's a question of what your palate pleasure says. And what I suggest to you is, if you buy into the conventional wisdom that, you know, that, that I've described, animals matter. They may not matter as much as human beings. We matter more. In situations of real conflict, we win, they lose. But it's got to be real conflict. And what you're deciding to eat tonight, or what you think is fashionable in terms of whether you want to wear leather or fur, because I, I, I mean, I don't distinguish this anti-fur movement. I have been in this, involved in this movement for 30 years now, and I find it bizarre that they talk about fur. What, there's no difference between fur and leather and wool. It's all the same. And, and um, you know, I, as a matter of fact, I think the anti-fur movement is pretty misogynistic in a lot of ways and has, has had a, a misogynistic history. But, but, you know, the bottom line is, is that, you know, um, when you decide what you think you look good in, or, or when you're deciding like what, what your taste buds tell, you know, if you're telling me that my pleasure, my palate pleasure, 
justifies my eating this cheese pizza when, in fact, in order to get the cheese, you got to keep the cow continually pregnant, and all the males are sold into veal, and the females are cycled into, this, into the, the, the dairy industry, and these poor cows are constantly kept pregnant, and they're constantly milked by these machines, um, and, and they get mastitis, and it's a horrible life, and then they're sent to slaughter. And bottom line is, you know, if you're eating that cheese, then you need to tell me how that's any different from Mike Vick saying, I like watching dogs fight. And so if we don't think what he did was okay, then we need to look to ourselves and say, is what we're doing okay? Because you know what? Honest to God, I've never heard, never, never. And even before Mike Vick came along, I was using a, I, I had a, uh, in this book I wrote in 2000, Introduction to Animal Rights, I had this character called Simon the Sadist, who was basically doing these horrible things and people were upset with him. And, and so then the question was, well, why are you not upset with yourself if you're upset with this guy? So Michael Vick sort of gave an, a, a new identity to Simon the Sadist. But, but, um, but in the whole, the whole time I've been doing this, not once, not once has anyone ever given me a good answer as to how somebody like Mike Vick is like worse than the rest of us, you know? And so then the rest of the book is we look at like 30 some odd different butts. We call them the butts. And Anna, why don't you describe those? Uh, <laughs> well, um, one thing that we wanted to examine is, is um, what you have to turn off in order to be a meat eater once you've decided that animals matter morally. Um, because the reaction that so much of the population had to Vic the mirror is never turned around on the person who is consuming them uh, at the dinner table wearing them or um, using them in, in entertainment. And we know what we're doing. No one thinks that, that meat grows on trees. There's more and more information available. But it's cold, dead flesh, and it bleeds. And it may be in a plastic package. But everybody knows what they're doing. And if you discuss it, it's, the reaction is usually, oh, don't let's talk about that. You'll put me off my dinner. And indeed, the conversation would. Because we have to turn off an awful lot. We have to turn off the reaction that looks at all the use of animals in advertising and children's stories, all the cute lambs and the, the cute puppies and the little ducklings that bring out something in us. There's a, there's a reaction. It's not just because they're furry. It's, there's, a, there's a, you want to put your arms around them and hug them and you feel that. There's another being. There's a relationship that could be established there. We all, many of us live with animals at home. We know mm -hmm. that they're sensitive. We know that they feel pain. We know that they're complex psychologically. They know, we know that they can have a well-being or, or a situation of not well-being. We get really angry. When, when one of our domestic companion animal type dogs, uh, dogs or cats, is, uh, hits the, the uh, news in a cruelty case. So how much do we have to turn off to keep eating them? Yeah, and, and you know, these Michael Vick situations abound. We had a situation in Newark where some woman was prosecuted. You know, again, you know, I don't know if, how many of you heard about I mean, everybody's heard about Michael Vick, but there's this other case Patrick the dog. I don't know how many of you have heard about Patrick. Patrick was this dog that this woman was prosecuted because she took the dog and she put the dog in a, in a, in a garbage, bag. garbage bag and put the dog in, a, in the garbage. And the dog was rescued and the dog was then brought back to, to health. And this woman, um, you know, uh, is prosecuted and she, she was at the time I wrote this editorial. She was facing 18 months in prison. And, and I wrote this editorial saying, well, you know, Everybody's upset with, um, with was it Tisha Stewart, Tisha Edwards? I forget what her name was. Um, but everybody was upset with this woman. And I said, yeah, what she did was really terrible. But who of us is going to go to jail for 18 months because we eat meat or we eat eggs or we eat dairy and we have no better justification than we like to taste? So like, how are we any better than this woman? Because I don't get that. I, I just don't get that. And why is it okay to put her in a cage for 18 months when the rest of us are like doing this stuff? I, I don't get that. I just don't get that. 
And, and so I, I have this tendency to believe that the reason why we do this is because we sort of need to think of ourselves as good people and you know, pat ourselves on the back. And we do this by, by creating these completely insane, you know, what I call moral schizophrenia. I mean, just de delusional in the way, that, in the way that, that, that clinical schizophrenia can be delusional. Just delusional thinking where we actually sort of say, this woman should go to jail. Michael Vick should never be forgiven. The woman in England, you know, should be vilified and compared to Adolf Hitler. And we're all eating these, these, these creatures. We're eating them, we're wearing them. You know, we're using, I mean, you know, I mean, we're participating in all sorts of, I mean, look, the bottom line is, for all the zillions and trillions and quadrillions of animals we exploit every year, the only use of animals we make that isn't transparently frivolous is the use of animals to find cures for serious human illnesses. Now, I don't think that's justifiable either, but that is at least requires a discussion. The rest of it, frankly, it's a no-brainer. And you don't even need a theory of animal rights. This is sort of the, the, you know, for years I've been sort of arguing a theory of animal rights that leads to this. This does not require that you accept a theory of animal rights. It just requires that you take seriously what you say you believe. And you know, what's really interesting to me is like, I do this with like, groups of non-animal people, you know, and, you know, at, 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 you know, various venues, you know, and I talk about this stuff, and it's really quite remarkable, it's like people have never really sort of thought about this before. And I say, you know, what the hell's the difference between the dog who's a member of your family and the animal you're sticking a fork into? One you love, one you eat. You tell me, how does that work with you? Because I don't understand that. And so, so the only use of animals that we make that I think presents a moral, a, a, you know, a, a more interesting moral discussion, requires a more interesting moral discussion is like, you know, I mean, I, I, the idea that we're going to kill some animals and find a cure for cancer is, is, is just dumb. But I mean, it's an interesting hypothetical, it, and it's just that. It's a hypothetical. Um, because that's not the way cancer is ever going to be cured. Actually, cancer would probably be reduced dramatically if we stop eating rotting flesh, cow mucus, and other sorts of things that we put into our bodies. But, um, but, but uh, you know, we're not going to end up uh, curing illnesses in that way. But let's assume we could. That's then interesting. And we could, you know, I mean, you know, that, that requires a little bit more sophistication in terms of the way they argue. The rest of it's a no-brainer, you know. And, and so, so what we did, you know, then with the rest of the book is, you know, we do like, you know, we deal with the butts that people deal with all the time. And we actually collected these by like asking people, what do you hear when you go home? You know, <laughs> say, but doesn't God want us to eat animals? But isn't eating animal products natural? But what if everyone ate just plant foods? There wouldn't be enough land to grow food. What if I ran a desert island starving to death? What would happen to all the animals if we did not eat them? Um, we brought animals into existence to be eaten. That is what they are here for. Um, do animals feel pain in the way that humans do? Do fish feel pain? What about plants? Do you know how many times? Do you know how many times? Do, so this, this year I will be 60 years old, and I was thinking, I have probably, and I have to tell I mean, I, I don't do this for health reasons, but I became a vegan when I was 20. I, 20, 28, I guess. Yeah, I was 28. And I have to tell you, I feel better at 60 than I did when I was eating, you know, that stuff uh, when I was in my 20s. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm telling you, um, uh, now, you know, you have to eat a sensible vegan diet. You can't, you know, you can't, you can be an unhealthy vegan by eating tons and tons of fried foods and, and you know, and, and all these processed foods. I don't eat any, you know, we don't eat any processed foods and stuff. And we just, and you know what, this business, that, you know, one of the things in here is, but isn't being a vegan elitist and expensive? The answer is, I got news for you. Fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, seeds, invariably cost less than a diet that's got animal products. I mean, the problem, if there's a problem, the problem is in a lot of poor areas where we want people to consume liquor and cigarettes and fried chicken, well, we don't care about people in these food deserts, like Newark, for example. Um, you know, and we're working on that. You know, there are people, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a real effort right now to try to get greater food variety. But it's, it's not a question of being a vegan costs more. I mean, you know, yeah, the prepared foods, you know, the, the, the fake hamburgers and the fake this and the fake that, and a lot of these things, the fake sausages and the tofurkeys and stuff, these things are, are a lot of them are expensive. Um, but they also have like no nutritional value and, and tons of salt. Um, and so, you know, if you don't buy that stuff, um, and if you're just eating fruits and vegetables and green and, and, and beans and grains, it's easy to be, you know, we were sitting around the other night, we had, we, I had gone to an Indian grocery store and I bought, you know, um, a large quantity of moong dal, which is uh, what happens when you take a moong bean and you take the skin off of it. 
And you know, they come in these bags for like a dollar ninety-eight, two pound bags. And we like threw, you know, threw two pounds of this on the stove. We made it, we put some spices in. You know, it cost, and we, we ate it over like, you know, two nights, maybe I think a third night. And basically it was like two dollars. You know, we had some other stuff with it, and but not, but you know, the, it's not expensive to be a vegan. You know, you have to have the stuff available to you, and in a lot of areas, you know, we 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 um, we push people to consume garbage uh, because that's a, a feature of racism in our country and of classism is we push people to eat garbage and um, and to hurt themselves and to, to eat stuff that no human being should put their bodies under any circumstances. And and uh, as a matter of fact, in Newark. Um, so, some years ago, my, my students and I, we actually did a project to see how, how far one had to walk to get a fresh vegetable and how far one had to walk to get a bottle of liquor. And um, one could get a bottle of liquor in about 27 places um, you know, that were within a stone's throw of the university, whereas one couldn't find a fresh vegetable anywhere. Um, and you know, and that's, a, that, that's a problem. Um, but it's not, it's not because the stuff is inherently more expensive. It's because this is what we do. This is a, a, a feature of American racism. But, um, but, but, you know, so we try to sort of deal with these things, you know, what about plants? No, plants aren't sentient. It's okay, you can eat them all you want. They don't care. I mean, they are alive. They are not sentient. So, like, don't worry about it. Go and eat them. Um, and, and um, you know, and other issues, you know, is it natural? You know, does God want us to do this? Because we get this a lot. People say, you know, doesn't God want us to eat animals? I don't know. I haven't talked to them recently. But, you know, the, but, you know I mean, look, but again, there are answers for all these things. I mean, you know, because that's one you get all the time. People say, don't, doesn't God want us to eat animals? And they're always saying, well, you know, God gave us animals to eat. Okay. God also, like, if you look at, you know, I mean, depending on which God you're talking about, but, you know, you look at, for example, the Old Testament. You, you can find a justification for anything you want there. There's human slavery, there's rape, there's all sorts of like really bad stuff in the Old Testament. But look at the, look at the Old Testament. In the beginning, when the, when in this mythology, when, the, when, when God creates um, the earth, God says to Adam, Adam God says that to, to humans, the herb and the seed I give you to eat, it shall be your food. And God also says this to the animals. There is no killing in the Garden of Eden. There is no death. Nobody's eating animals. It is only when there's a rupture in the covenant between God and humans that people start, that, that you start having violence. Violence comes into existence only when the covenant is ruptured. There was no violence in the state of grace, or however you wish to describe it. There is no, there is no uh, violence. And, 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 so, and, and when you look later in the Old Testament, when the covenants are restored, the prophets say, the lion shall lie down with the lamb, none shall be harmed in all of my holy kingdom, and all that sort of stuff. So like, if you're into that thing, if, that, if that's what you're into, I would suggest that um, there are some really powerful arguments that even if you buy into that mythology, you know, even if you buy into that sort of way of thinking, um, it, it, it still points in the vegan direction. Look, the bottom line is everything points in the vegan direction. But, um, and, and, and so that's what we try to do in the rest of the book. But in any event, that's it, folks. You want to ask some questions? <laughs> yes, Corey. Yes, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if you can address capitalism. I'm wondering if you think that abolitionism is at all compatible with capitalism. And um, that's because, I mean, capitalism is competition. When you have competition, you have losers. And the problem is that the losers tend not to be readily distributed. I mean, it tends to be women, it tends to be people of color. In this country, it tends up in immigrants, and of course, it's other animals. So, I mean, people gain profit in this system by exploiting other animals and exploiting other humans. So, you see abolitionism at all compatible with it. Interestingly, interestingly um, animals have been things and have been property in just about every system. What, you know, I mean, look, animals are property in Cuba, right? I mean, um, uh, and it's not that, you know, if you abolish capitalism and you have, you know, you have socialism or, you know, I mean, animals are property, they have been in, you know, anarchist communes. So, I mean, this is one of the things we're going to talk about in this conference we have on April 11th, because David Niebuhr, who's a terrific guy, uh, David, um, you know, is a real, I, and look, I don't like, I, I think capitalism is a, is a really uh, terrible system, although I'm not sure we, that that's what we have now in this, this country. I think we have sort of an, an oligarchical system. Um, but um, I don't think capitalism is a, I don't like it. But um, I think the way we treat animals is an interesting, raises an interesting question for pure Marxist theory in that to the extent that Marx said that morality 
is, it, you know, morality comes from, you know, is it, part of the superstructure which comes from the economic substructure. Um, it seems that we have morally classified animals prior to um, the, 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 the development of just about every economic system. So, so in a sense, um, and I, I'm not enough, I, I, you know, I, 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 I'd be curious to know if, if there's any Marxist theorists, because I've raised this with David, and I, and I really haven't gotten a very satisfying answer. I'm hoping that on the 11th of April, all of this will come out. But, um, but I think that there are issues that are raised for a Marxist theorist, and, and I think we could, you know, we could decide. I mean, the thing about capitalism is, um, you know, you, you, it does require alienation and it requires commodification, but what commodification you have um, is another question. And you could have systems of sort of mixed capitalist socialist systems where commodification is modified significantly. Um, and and so you know I, I don't I mean I do think you could have an abolitionist system I think you I think we could become vegans while we're still capitalists. Um, the good thing about a, a, on a simple everyday approach to not complicated economics, but just our our commerce, our purchasing power, gives individuals the opportunity to make a difference by their purchasing choices. The only reason animal agriculture exists as it does today is that there's a demand for it and there's a demand at a certain price. So if you buy it, they will raise the animals to fulfill the, the commercial demand for it. If you say, I want lentils, they will grow lentils. If, you, if, you, if the demand for meat um, or dairy diminishes, there are very few people who on principle are going to be raising animals that nobody wants to buy. So at a time when a lot of people are thinking, oh my goodness, it's very hard for me to make a change, it's hard for me to, my voice to, to matter, we can't necessarily affect foreign policy. We can't uh, deal with the, the larger questions of working environments. But we all go out and buy something for dinner. And if you create a demand for um, um, more plant products, your local supermarkets will start stocking them. They just look at what disappears from the shelves. You could be a bit more organized and say, I would like this, and would you order this, and make suggestions and things like that. But for everyday people, that's something they can do. The idea, as Gary was mentioning before, that this is some sort of elite pocket of, of uh, concerned citizens who, who just have to eat organic arugula at every meal. I got a, we got an um, um, email the other day saying, this is really interesting, but I just can't afford all these exotic fruits you have to eat. <laughs> so, you know, in with the goji berries and apples don't count. So it, it, if this is, this is practical, it's, I think it's very um, important in terms of social justice, because as Gary was mentioning, we need to get some decent food into people who can't afford the choices that they're being presented with right now. You know, Go to North Philadelphia and see what the options are. Go to Newark and see what the options are. Go to Chester and see what the options are. Some years ago, I, I was asked to give a talk at Scranton, University of Scranton, and it's a Jesuit place, and I thought, ah, oh, you know, it's gonna, you know, it's a Catholic school, and you know, I'm going to get the soul argument. And I'm going to get you know the genesis. Argument. So I thought, you know, I've got to come up with a different sort of approach. And what I basically started off with is to say, look, you know, we feed enough grain every every day to animals in this country that we're going to slaughter. We could give two loaves of bread to like everybody on the planet. And like, if you don't really care about animals at all, that raises a hell of a human rights issue, you know. And so, I mean, the animal agriculture. You want to talk about elitism? I'll tell you what's elite: animal agriculture eating animal foods. That is elite. There is nothing more elite in the whole universe than the idea that your palate pleasure can justify imposing suffering and death on another being. That's elitism. Elitism is the, con con the consumption of resources, you know, that where we could feed hundreds of millions of people with the grain that we feed animals that we're going to slaughter. You know, this is the thing, is what, what happens if we all become vegan? What's going to happen? Is there enough place that, you know what? If we all became vegan, there would be fewer acres under cultivation. 
Why? Because you got to grow a lot. You know, if, when, you, when you have to give 12 pounds of plant protein to some cow to get one pound of flesh, you got to grow 12 pounds of plant protein, right? Okay? If you consume that, you know, humans consuming that, more humans can consume that, you know? And, and um, you know, and, and before anybody says, you know, well, but is this really idealistic and, 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 you know, too idealistic and could we ever, can we ever really expect things to change? The answer is um, too prompt. We are never going to ch get it to change as long as these big animal groups are promoting happy meat and happy exploitation and, and sending love letters to, to CEO John Mackey of Whole Foods saying that, you know, that they, I mean, you know, there was, there's a letter I posted. I posted every opportunity I possibly can um, on my website, on my Facebook site, and I was thinking of having a tattoo. Um, and it's a letter, it's a letter that was written in 2005, signed by Peter Singer, um, and, and, and on behalf of PETA, whom Anna and I were involved with many years ago uh, in the early 1980s, um, when there were about 20 people involved. Um, and so it's not, you know, I, I like Ingrid. I liked Alex. He's no longer Alex Pacheco. I mean, he's no longer with PETA. But, you know, I've known Wayne Pacell at HSUS for 25 years of my life. Um, you know, uh, some of the younger people I don't know. But, I mean, you know, the people have been kicking around a while. These are people I were, we worked with in the early 1980s when we first got involved with this. And, um, and you know, so they signed this letter. They sent a letter to John Mackey in 2005 signed by PETA, HSUS, Farm Sanctuary, Mercy for Animals, Compassion Over Killing, all of these bloated animal charities, saying, we express our appreciation and support of your pioneering animal compassion program. I mean, basically saying, we think, you know, we express our appreciation and support. And then they say, oh, we're not supporting Happy Meat. Sorry, sorry. When you make public statements saying, we when you make public statements normatively praising things like the Animal Compassionate Program, when Wayne Passell sits on the board of directors of the Global Animal Partnership, which is developing the animal welfare rating that, that Whole Foods now uses, when Wayne's a member of that board, when HSUS is busy having a farmer outreach program and having barbecues where they're roasting animals, talking about stewardship and sustainable agriculture, that ain't going nowhere. As far as, far as I'm concerned, that is, that is elitist. And that has one goal, making everybody feel comfortable about exploiting animals. That is never going to get us to go in the right direction. But it's not, it's not a question of getting everybody to go vegan. It's a question of, you know, there are these guys that run Salir, Polytechnical Institute in New York, Troy. And they wrote a paper, which, again, I post a lot because I think it's a fabulous paper. They did a paper in which they argued. They did statistical analysis, and they said, if you get 10% of a population really firmly committed to an idea, things begin to change. Now, I'll be more conservative than that and say, I'm not even saying if we get 10% of the population to go vegan for ethical reasons, that things are going to are going to change. I will tell you this: if 10% of the population accepted veganism as a moral baseline, that if animals matter, whatever else you can do with them, you can't eat them, you can't wear them for fashion, you know, you can't eat them because they taste good or wear them because they look good. That that if you got 10% of the population, we'd be having a different discussion. We wouldn't be sitting around talking about the treatment issues and whether or not we can make animal treatment humane enough so that it's morally acceptable to eat animals, we'd be talking about whether it's okay to use them, which is the, the interesting question, which we don't talk about now because the, the, the large groups still control. I mean, these, are, these organizations control huge amounts of money and they shape the discourse. But like all social movements. The grassroots have to change the conversation or it goes nowhere. And the same is true of this, of this movement. And as much as you try to change the law, as a matter of fact, the first book, the first three books I wrote were published by Temple University Press. And I love Temple University Press and I love Temple University. But um, the first book I wrote, Animals, uh, Property, and the Law, the whole thesis of that book was animals are property. Therefore, 
As a, as a legal matter, they are property. They're chattel property. They have no inherent value, no intrinsic value. They only have extrinsic value and external value. And it costs money to protect animal interests. And the more money, the more, more you protect their interests, the more expensive animal ownership becomes. Now, the animal producers don't care as long as they can, as long as they can pass it on, that's fine. But if they can't pass it on, demand goes down. So what's going to happen, and what I did in that book, um, which, you know, it's 20 some, you know, it's 20 years old, it's almost 20 years old now, but I stand by it because, as a matter of fact, there's been more empirical proof in the 20 years since I wrote it that basically animal welfare standards will never rise much above, if at all, the level of protection required in order to efficiently exploit the animal economically. That is, we'll protect animal interests to the extent that we get an economic benefit from doing so. And we don't go beyond that. So in a sense, animal welfare standards are things that a rational property owner would do anyway if she had perfect information. And so if you look at the history of the animal, of the anim, of the animal welfare movement, what do you see? Look at the Animal Welfare, the uh, uh, Humane Slaughter Act of 1958, okay? Where, where you know, they required large animals to be stunned before they're shackled and hoisted. Why do you think industry went along with that? You th I mean, why do you think? I will tell you why. Read the legislative history and you'll see it in black and white. Industry went along with it because when you have a 2,000 pound animal hanging upside down by her back leg, she, she, she gets carcass damage, which costs you money because cows are expensive. And animals move and hit workers. You have injured workers. You have, you have problems, okay? So stunning the animal was accepted as being an economically rational thing to do. And it's why chickens weren't included under the 1958 Slaughter Act. And now, interestingly, you have uh, a number of these groups, uh, PETA and other organizations, saying, oh, chickens should be protected under the Humane Slaughter Act. And what do they offer as arguments? Well, when they're talking to animal advocates, they say it's morality, it's morality. But look at the documents they're producing. And the documents they're producing have study after study after study that say that controlled atmosphere killing, gassing the chickens, is a more economically efficient thing to do. It's economics. This is not changing. This is not moving animals away from the property paradigm. This is further enmeshing them in the property paradigm. As a matter of fact, I, I, you know, people say to me, well, don't you think these, these organizations are doing some good? Let me be real frank with you. I don't think any of them is doing any good whatsoever. I think they're counterproductive. I think what they're doing is encouraging people to believe that they discharge their moral obligations when they get into the car and they drive over to Whole Foods and they buy animal welfare rating number two chicken or something like that and they say, I'm a good person, let me pat myself on the back. And, and I got, you know, these organizations are selling stamps of approval. You know, give us your donation and we'll make you feel good about eating that chicken. Give us that, don you know, give us your donation and we'll make you feel good about exploiting animals. Now, you know, look, I know these people and I'm not saying that, you know, that I, I think on some level, because I've talked with them about, you know, we, have, we do have discussions occasionally. Um, and, and I think on some level they do think that this is sensitizing people and that this is going to incrementally change things. But, you know, look, man, you know, I mean, I mean, 32 years, 32 years I've been doing this, and I remember 32 years ago, you know, people telling me, well, you've got to focus on fur. If you sensitize people to fur, it'll just make everything fall apart. Well, you know what? The fur industry is stronger now than it was 32 years ago. You know, these single-issue campaigns, these welfareist campaigns, they simply don't work. They never have, they never will. This, once you get people to stop eating them, because remember, that's our primary relationship with animals. We stick them into our mouths three times a day, sometimes more. And the bottom line is, as long as people are sticking them in their mouth and wearing them on their feet, wearing them on their body because they think they look good or because they like the taste of that cheese pizza or they like the taste of those wings or whatever it is they like the taste of, you know? As long as people think animals matter that little, nothing changes. Once people, once people 
realize that they, that, that can't be justified, everything changes. Then they're not going to SeaWorld anymore. I mean, the, you, you don't start a campaign by saying, oh, look at what they're doing with the orcas. Because why? I mean, why do we care about the orcas and not the sea lions? You know, we care about the orcas because there's now an industry of cognitive ethologists who say, well, orcas are like us cognitively. So what? So what? You know, I mean, a sea lion values his or her life and values his or her interest. The fact that, that orcas may think more like us or great non-human great apes may think more like us. Who cares? Why is that relevant? Okay, other questions? Um, I don't, yeah, sir, <coughs> what's your name? Uh, my name is Bert. Hi, Bert. Uh, our question is about the economic push yep. and uh, laws around it. And on the production side of it, a lot of our agricultural laws give great benefit, economic benefit, to raising the crops that feed the animals sure. that are eaten. And uh, in fact, that's a big justification, say, for GMOs. That it's going to produce it more cheaply for whatever reason to feed the animals. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of, of the best way of, say, changing those laws, making the grain more expensive so that basically it becomes human food rather than animal food? Well, the, the problem is we subsidize animal foods. I mean, we also, yeah. I mean, we, you yeah. know, we subsidize animal foods. I mean, if you, if you really had to pay, if you had to pay the real cost of that pound of beef, you know, it would be like $65 or something. And, and so we subsidize that. Having said that, um, you know, uh, this economic incentive for us is still to eat vegan because it's still cheaper to eat vegan. Um, look, uh, again, Bert, you know, you're asking sort of a big picture question. What can we do to sort of, you know, what we could do is, um, you know, we could sort of act on the fact that um, most of us think that, the, that to call the people in Congress clowns is an insult to clowns. And, and, and to basically sort of just vote them out and, and you know, have, have, a, have a different, you know, different configuration. Um, and have people who are, you know, responsive to us and not to large corporations. But, you know, that's not something, that's not something you can do tonight, it's not something I can do tonight. But what we can do tonight when we get out of here is we're going to go eat something and, you know, we can consume something nonviolent. And we can take, take nonviolence seriously. As I always say to people, don't talk to me about, don't let words of nonviolence come out of your mouth if violence is going into your mouth. Um, and, and so, um, you know, uh, uh, but no, I agree. I agree with you completely that uh, there are, you know, when Anna was saying before, Demand drives it. Um, yeah, demand drives it. There are certain things which, which influence our demand, and there are certain economic ways in which we're manipulated so that we so that we like certain things. And we're manipulated in all sorts of ways. I mean, you know, we're manipulated by by this this idea that if you don't eat meat, you're not going to be you know you're going to you're going to be a weakling, and you're going to be you know. I mean, I, the, the amount of people who sort of, the number of people, particularly men, who think that you know they will not be manly. In Vera, um, if they don't consume animal products, it's just mind-boggling. Um, and and um, but you know, so, and that's that's stuff that we've been taught. But but at some point in time, we've got to take responsibility for rejecting the crap that is fed to us, both literally and and intellectually. Um, and we have an obligation to sort of say, no, I'm not buying into that, you know. And and so um, you know, but yeah, I, I hear I hear what you're saying, and um, and I do think that um, you know our political uh, uh, the people in Congress are tremendously beholden to the to animal agriculture, which is just like a giant industry. I mean, it's like a giant industry. And yeah, go ahead. Because one of the things I think drives it is the fact that it is so cheap. People don't think about it. People feel that this is threatened by the price going up on it, they think less about it because it costs less. They think more about things that cost more. And the whole system is rigged so that it costs an absolute minimum amount of money to produce. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. It's interesting, interesting perspective. Yes, sir. Yeah. What's your name? What's your name? Yeah. Frank. Frank. What do you mean by the phrase, the moral community? Can you use it? Um, the community of beings who are not things. It's a binary world, Frank. You're either a person or you're a thing. You know, this is a thing. Um, you know, this is a thing. I am a person. 
Doesn't mean I'm a human. What do you mean when you say animals are part of the world? They have moral value. They're, they're not just things with external, extrinsic, economic value, but they're things that have, look, you have a value, Frank. You value yourself even if everybody around you and everybody in the world, if everybody says, Frank, you know, we don't like Frank. Frank still values Frank even if nobody else values Frank. Frank values himself. He has an internal or, 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 or inherent value. He values himself. Um, and, and, you know, your interests matter to you, even if they don't matter to anybody else. Your life matters to you, even if, they don't, even if it doesn't matter to anybody else. And so, animals are like us in the sense that they have interests. Unlike, um, this doesn't have any interests, okay? There's, it, there's nothing it prefers, desires, or wants. Plants don't have any interests. They're alive, but there is no mind there that prefers or desires or wants anything, okay? So they react, they don't respond. You know, I mean, they react in the same way that if you put an, elect if you put an electrical current through a, a, a wire, a bell will go off. Um, and, and, and so, um, when I'm talking about the moral community, I'm saying animals have moral value. That is, um, we have moral obligations that we owe to them by virtue of their being sentient beings who value themselves. So, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying they're not things. In the binary world in which we live in, in which, in which one is either a thing and outside the moral community or a person and inside the moral community. Animals are persons. As a matter of fact, one of the, the books that I wrote is a book called Animals as Persons. Um, and people always say, well, well, how can you say they're persons? Because they think that they're, what I mean by that is humans. I'm saying, no, no, no. What I'm saying is they, they have moral value. Like humans, they have moral value. But they don't, but of course, when you say moral, you don't mean ethical. You just mean... I don't know, understand the distinction between moral and ethical. I, well, I understand I what you're making. You were saying moral community. I'm thinking, you know, ethics, but I thought well, animals don't have practiced ethics. Like, they no, don't they don't. Them. But neither do people who are mentally disabled. Neither do some young children. No, I mean, no, I, I can have, have I can have moral. Yeah. How right. Moral. I can have. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I can have moral obligations to beings who can't reciprocate. Now there are some people who say you can only have. I mean, I mean there there are some people who have, who say and who have said that you can only have moral obligations to those who can reciprocate. I don't I don't think those arguments are uh, interesting, let alone. I mean, I, I think they're just bad arguments. Um, and and so I don't think you need to be able to reciprocate. I mean, if somebody's mentally disabled, for example, that person may not be able to have moral obligations that they that they owe, owe to you know that they have to me. But I may and I would maintain that I, as a matter of fact, I would maintain I have stronger moral obligations to vulnerable humans and to non-humans than I do to others, or at least one could make an argument like that. Um, so that's what I mean, okay? Right. Yes, what's your name? Uh, Anne. Anne, hi. Do you think people don't know how brutal factory farming is, or they're desensitized, or they know discount, or they, what is it? I mean, I, don't I, think, know, it's a, I think it's a combination. If you go to your local bookstore, to the extent that they still exist, go and look at the, what we what we tell children about animals. There's a little red barn, and little? there's a, I say there's a little the children's stories that we still publish for for this generation of children. Animals are out in the fresh air. There's a red barn. There's roosters pecking. There's a happy cow. There's relationships between the farmers. This is the the myth that we take on probably quite early on in childhood, when it finally dawns on us what's on our plate. Because um, I'm sure many of you have had that experience with your own children or remember it from your own childhood. When it dawns on you that you're eating one of those creatures that you like in other circumstances, that you read the books about, that you see in cartoons, or that you have running around your house, a lot of human children have that revulsion against eating one of those creatures. So you have to be reassured that it's okay, probably told that, told that God wants you to do so, and that it's okay and we turn it off again. And we just carry that on into adulthood, really with blinders on, because there's no one in this room who doesn't know where animal um, products come from, although there's a, 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 a studied ignorance, really, about the process, because 56 billion animals and we've got to raise them, and we've got to transport them, and we've got to kill them, and we've got to process them. It's not going to be nice, is it? 
and they're not dying of old age, and they're not very depressed from committing suicide. They are raised in intense, stressful, cruel situations, have an atrocious death. We, we all know this. I, but I don't know that we do all know this. Well, I, in that, I, I, I mean, I'm not, until a few years ago, I saw when I saw the video of Veggie mm. and then I'm just, I was just reading Eating Animals, and I don't know if people know how bad it is. Well, it's hard to get the, inf it has been hard to get the information out. It was always almost impossible to get slaughter information out There's onto the animals. networks. There, now there are many more media outlets and there's the internet and stuff, so there is more information out there. So the opportunity for self-education is, is certainly um, easier. But the, the, the barrier, because we still want to consume them, is just as high. And I would say this. First of all, I do think there's a lot of information out there. Um, and, and I want to make a comment about the egg gag laws in a second. But I also want to say, my position is, even if you could raise them humanely, whatever the hell that means, I mean, I don't see the problem as factory farming. I mean, I think factory farming is terrible, but I don't see that as the problem. I see the problem as animal use, period. So, so you know, it's like saying, well, if I'm going to kill you, Ann, is it, you know, is it better that I, um, you know, that I don't torture you, and that I wait until you're asleep, and that I just put a gun to the back of your head, and if I do it right, you won't feel a thing. And the answer is, well, you know, that's better than torturing you, but have I harmed you if I kill you in that way? And the answer is, yes, I have. And see, my view is, even if you had a cow that was a member of the family, came in, sat at the table every night, you know, um, it was over for Christmas, and everybody, you know, and then you killed the animal while the animal was sleeping. I still think that's wrong. So in a sense, for me, the argument, it doesn't, it doesn't rest on whether or not, you know, this, see, I think, I think that's part of the argument that a lot of these animal groups make, is that they try to sort of say, well, the problem is factory farming. And the thing is, no, no, it's not factory farming, it's animal use. Because once you say it's factory farming, then the issue becomes, how do we make it better? And because of the property status of animals, you will never make it significantly better. What you will do is you will tinker at the edges. You will put padding on the waterboards that use at Guantanamo Bay. But you, but you know, whether you're, pad, whether you're waterboarded on a padded waterboard or a bare waterboard, it's still an unpleasant experience, I would imagine. And so, so um, you know, uh, so I don't think you're going to make it humane. But even if you did, um, I don't think that it's morally justifiable, and I think that's, that it, it still raises a very serious moral problem. Is it all right to kill? Now, interestingly, if you look at the history of ideas, this, where we all, you know, obviously, you know, there's a background noise in our lives in terms of like these moral ideas that we may not even know where they come from. I mean, most of us, for example, walk around with like a lot of Plato in our heads, even if we've never studied Plato, because, you know, there, a lot of our ideas are platonic. Um, but um, the whole animal welfare uh, uh, approach comes from basically the 19th century, where you had social reformers like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill and those guys, who were basically they were focused on suffrage. You know, they wrote on women's you know women's uh, right to vote. They were opposed to human slavery and things like that. And then they said, well, you know, what about animals? And Bentham has the you know B Bentham you know has this this came out with, well, others as well, but, but basically the 19th century utilitarians came up with this idea that animal suffering matters because, you know, animals can suffer, so they matter morally. They're part of the moral community, right? And said they may, because, because they can suffer, because they can experience things, because they have experiences, because they have interests, they are members of the moral community, we have a moral obligation to them. And we can't exclude them simply because they're not rational, or they can't, we don't think that they're rational, or they can't use symbolic communication, they don't use language to communicate or whatever. All of these things, you know, don't mean that it's all right for us to exploit them. But what Bentham thought, what Mill thought, what Peter Singer thinks, by and large, is that if animals, you know, that, that, that animals don't have an interest, or at least most animals don't have an interest in continuing to live, because they're not self-aware, they can't look in the mirror and say, that's me. Um, you know, and that they're, they're, they're not self-aware, so that they don't have an interest in continuing to live, they just have an interest in not suffering. Now, I think that that's nonsense, and I think that that's speciesist. I mean, I think that there are different ways of being uh, self-aware. 
And I don't think that 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 your status as a as a as a as a non-human person turns on whether you have human-like self-awareness. I mean, let's think about this in a, in the human context. Let's imagine that you have two human beings. One is somebody who is a normal person. The other is somebody who's got transient global amnesia, which is a form of amnesia where you don't have a sense of the past and you don't have a sense of the future. You are stuck in an eternal present. And there are such people. Um, are those two people equal? Interesting question. The answer is, depends for what purpose. Because if you ask me, are they equal, I would say, why are you asking me that? Well, if, you're, if, the, if the question is, we're going to hire a history professor. Should we hire this person who's got a PhD in history, or should we hire somebody who's got trained in global amnesia, doesn't remember anything about the past and can't imagine anything about the future? I would say, well, geez, you know, if you need a history professor, you're probably better off with, not with the person who's got transit global amnesia. But if the question is, who do we use as a non-consenting subject in a biomedical experiment or as a forced organ donor, do we use the normal person or the person who's got transit global amnesia? The answer is, we don't use either. It's wrong to use either of them. And the fact that the person who doesn't have a sense of the past and a sense of the future, is that person different from you and me? The answer is, yeah, but so what? I mean, what does that mean in terms of morally how we treat that person? That person is self-aware in the second. That is, somebody who's got transit global amnesia is, is very much aware of herself in each second. And she wants to get to each second, next second. So she has an interest in continuing to live. It may not be the same interest that you and I have because we're planning things, you know, in six months we're going to go on a vacation, you know, next year we're going to do this, we're going to take the family and do that, blah, blah, blah. You know, we can, there are all sorts of things that, 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 that are part of what it means to you and for you and me to be self-aware where someone who, who's stuck in an eternal present doesn't have that same way of thinking about things. So what? That person is, you know, so, so, so I don't know whether, you know, we, we have five rescued uh, animals in our house, five rescued dogs. And, um, I, I, you know, I think it's fair, you know, if you ask me, do they think, I think that's is like, I would find it as peculiar a question as saying, do they have tails? I would say, well, like, look, you know, they have, you know, look, you can see they have these tails coming out. Um, if you watch them, if you watch how they behave, it's almost impossible. Well, no, no, I take that back. It is impossible to understand their behavior without positive cognition going on. Do they have a sense of the future? Yeah, I think they do. Do they have a sense of the past? Yeah, I think they do. But who the hell cares? I mean, you know, is it all right to use them in a biomedical experiment? No, I don't think so. Is it all right to kill, you know, eat them uh, or turn them into a pair of shoes? The answer is no, I don't think so. Because they have an interest in their lives. Uh, the one thing I do know is they have an interest, you know, in, in the moment. And as far as I'm concerned, that's all you need. That's why I believe that all you need for, for purposes of not being treated as a human resource is, um, is sentience. If you are perceptually aware, you're, you know, sentience is a means to the end of continued survival. And to say that, well, you know, I'm sentient, but I don't have an interest in continuing to live, is like saying, I have eyes, but I don't have an interest in continuing to see. It's ridiculous. It makes no sense. Um, one point I want to make about ag-gag laws before we move on. I think that a lot of the problem with ag gag laws, I mean, I think ag gag laws are bad because I don't like content-related um, restrictions on speech. But I think that, that a lot of these organizations are upset about the ag gag laws, not because they're worried about getting the information out, because there's tons of information about what goes on in factory farms. What troubles me about what a lot of these groups do with these, with these undercover investigations is they go into these places, they observe stuff for three months, they stand there, they watch it, they photograph it, and then they come out with a glitzy video which they fundraise off of. And a lot of these ag-gag laws, for example, require that people turn, if they see something wrong, Ill arguably legal, they have to turn it over to authorities right away. Well, that gets in the way of these organizations developing campaigns. And I think that the big, the big push against ag-gag laws has less to do with information getting out and more to do with these organizations that make a lot of money off of these campaigns in which they say, we went in and they're doing things which are abusive in this particular place um, and you know, we need to stop it. And that reinforces the idea in the public that you can do this the right way, that if you stop this particular factory farm from this particular practice, then you make it better. And I got news for you, you don't. Okay, yes, what's your name? Oh, Gail. Hi, Gail. Hi. Um, responding partly to what you said, I actually believe, if you look at how most people get their information, yeah. I don't believe it's that easy to know. Because most people get their information from crap 
media, and it's not on crack media. You can't find out this information. No, you got the internet now. The internet, the internet has changed the playing field. I don't think most people want to know. Well, that's the. That's I'm that's very the involved with um, climate action. So yeah. I'm not trying to compare the two, but I am trying to say that that you know most of us that have a brain know that the, the planet's in a lot of trouble, but most people don't want to talk about it. Don't want to do anything about it. I think it's the same. It's this level of this internal discomfort where people just turn something off, shut something down, because it's the only way they can deal with it. Gail, it's a great comment. I'm not sticking up for it. No, no, I know you're not. I know you're not. You're making an observation, and I don't disagree with you. I just think that that sort of what that says to me is, um, you know, well, the first part of what you said, it's hard to get the information. You know what? Um, as much as you know, I think it's a shame that something as wonderfully valuable as the internet is consumed, you know, is basically 70% of its pornography. And I think that's really, that really says something very sad about us as a species. But um, but you know, we can get we can get the information. We can get it more information than we've ever been able to get before. Unfortunately, people are not making value. I mean, you know, they read stuff on the internet, they automatically assume it's true, and you know, whatever. There's all sorts of problems there. But I, I think that that. Um, you know, the internet has really made the information available to us. If you're looking for it. Well, yeah, but if you're willfully ignorant, I mean, that's, but Gail, I, see, I look at willful ignorance and the fact that people don't want to know because they feel uncomfortable about it. What that to me is, is an invitation to make them feel uncomfortable about it because, um, they, because I mean, really, I mean, I, I'm, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's when, when somebody says to me, don't talk to me about that, it'll upset me. I won't do it when the person's eating because you know what? It, it, when someone's eating, having a discussion like this is like not going to go anywhere. But I, I understand that what that person is doing is actually inviting me to um, try to educate her or him about um, this issue because I think many of us are troubled by it. The third thing I would say is I think that a lot of these big issues, and this goes back to something Anna said before, a lot of these big issues are um, things we can't do anything about as individuals, but we can do something about um, our relationship with non-humans. That's something that's within our power to do. And I really believe that, you know, I mean, when I, I, I just finished reading Steve Pinker's book, you know, in which he says, you know, this is like a great era of peace relative to the rest of human um, uh, uh, history. And that, you know, we're, we're entering this really non-violent period or less violent period. And I have to tell you, I don't know what planet that guy's on, because I, I finished reading that book and I thought, it's sort of like Richard Dawkins who says, you know, well, if everybody accepted Western civilization, things would be so much better. Um, and and, um, and I, I find that sort of, um, react, I find that actually reactionary thinking, I find that really sort of disturbing, that anybody sort of looking around saying, oh, we're a whole lot less violent than we used to be in 1432. And, and, um, and the answer is, we're very violent and we've become, um, Anesthetize. I mean, we, we watch all these violent movies, and, and you know, there's all this junk on the internet that people watch, and they play these violent video games. Um, I don't think we're ever going to change anything until we change ourselves. And I think that 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 um, one of the things, one of the great virtues of the, the whole animal issue is if you, you know, is if you really get into it from a nonviolent perspective and really sort of accept it, you know, you know, like, I mean. If you realize what our moral obligations to non-humans are, it sort of changes your outlook about everything. And, and, and I think that that would be a really, it, 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 it helps you in terms of dealing with the particular issue, but I also help, I think it helps you get clear about a lot of stuff. I really do. Um, uh, yes, your name, yes. Um, Juliana. Juliana, hi. Hi. Um, so you've spoken about how a lot of nonprofits are really doing counterproductive work. Yeah. So moving forward, where do you think the most important work is happening? Like, where do you suggest? Grassroots, people, okay. you, you. That's what's happening. It's happening. It's happening on the grassroots level. I mean, I started this website, you know, in 2006, and you know, and I had to be dread. I mean, I, I don't like computers, and I don't, you know, like I, I, I have a cell phone. I have no idea how to use the damn thing, you know. And I, I like, I'm always messing up, and and um, but I didn't want to do this. And some guy uh, who was working at Apple at the time uh, contacted me. And said, "You need to do a website because you know the organization, you know, the the groups aren't going to promote your work, which is true. There is, there, and I'm proud of this, uh, Juliana. There is not one organization, not one in the United States of America, which sells any of my books. 
Um, and I am, and that tells me you're on the right track. Um, and and um, uh, and and so, you know, this guy said, well, you know, you're not going to get your stuff out to a large audience um, if you don't do use the internet. So he helped me design this, and I, I, you know, he's he's no longer around, but now I've got some other people who volunteer, you know, and 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 you know, the the. Um, if Corey can um, figure out how to show you the Facebook site, um, we, I've got 45,000 people, or almost 45,000 people on that, and it's gone up 32,000 in the past year. This is an idea whose time has come. People are hungry for it, people are reacting very positively to it, and people are realizing that animal advocacy is not sitting down and writing a check to a multi-million dollar organization. You know, so that people can fly here and take off their clothes and go naked rather than wear fur, or any of the nonsense, any of the uh, of the of the of the ridiculous things that these folks are doing. Um, and again, I'm not saying they don't they don't have a good faith. I mean, it's, I don't know. You know, I don't want to like get into any. I'm not. I don't want to judge them in terms of because I don't know what goes on in their hearts. But I, I think a lot of this stuff is just crazy, just kind of productive. And so it's not going to happen on the organizational level. It never. You know, charities, 501c3s, don't cause social revolutions. They don't shift paradigms. Um, grassroots. We need 10%. We need, if we had 10% of the population, you know, we had 10% of the population who were firmly committed to veganism as a moral baseline, we could change the world. We could. And it wouldn't, it's not that everybody would become vegan. Yeah, that's it. Um, 44,626. Okay, so it's going up. It's going up. Um, and so 40, 44,000, and, and it's gone up like 32,000, and I, there's not one paid boost. I haven't paid one penny, you know, to get, to get boosts, okay? And there are right now 12,000 people talking about the thing. Um, so, you know, and, and, and I'm getting like 300, 400 emails a day. I can't keep up with them. Um, you know, I have people, I have students that help me and, and, and stuff, you know, they go, they filter through and get rid of the wrong ones and keep the, they, they get rid of the wrong ones, they keep the wrong ones. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it, you're trying to sort of deal, I'm telling you, this is a, it's a tidal wave. People are really into this. Um, and, and I think we could have, we could get that 10%. You know, I remember, Juliana, if there was a meeting in 1985, there was a big meeting in D.C. amongst all the animal groups. And the issue was whether the groups were going to support the 1985 amendments to the Federal Animal Welfare Act, which I thought um, were horrible and counterproductive uh, in lots of ways. And I remember speaking at that meeting and I said, we all ought to put all of our time, all of our resources, all of our money, all of our energy, everything we do should be focused on one thing, getting people to stop eating. You know, we ought to be promoting veganism. Because once people get into that, it changes their whole outlook. And people said, oh, no, no, we can't do that. We have, you know, and it was basically, we need single-issue campaigns because that's what these people raise money off of. They send, you, they send you things and they say, oh, my God, there's, they're shooting squirrels in Holly, New York. Give us money and help us stop this. And the answer is, okay, fine. So they stop shooting the squirrels to raise money for the fire department, and they have a pig roast instead. Like, what's the victory there? And so, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, this is how what they do is, these campaigns that they have, whether they're welfare reform campaigns or whether they're, they're these, you know, these single-issue anti-fur campaigns or anti-this or anti-that campaign or you know, foie gras campaigns and stuff. I mean, what the hell's the difference between you know, if you eat goose liver or if you eat steak? What the hell's the difference? I mean, you, know, you have a campaign say, oh, we're going to stop people from eating this. So what? So they eat something else. They don't, they don't, they don't stop eating goose liver and then eat tofu. They, they, they switch to some other animal product. And so these, these are markers. These are, these are territory markers for these large organizations. And so in 1985, if we had put all of the time and energy, if you, and we're talking about it's big business. These organizations are big business. PETA's bringing in what? I don't know. I mean, PETA, they've got, they got places all over, the, all over the globe. And the last time I looked, they were bringing in $30, $40 million to PETA USA. HSUS brings in like a hundred and a quarter, $125 million every year. Last time I looked, they were sitting on top of $250 million. This is a lot of money. And so... You know, and look, you know, let them, I don't care, let them do their thing, that's fine. You know, but what I'm suggesting is that if we had put all of that time and energy and money into a sustained vegan campaign in 1985, we'd have that 10% right now. And what we've got now, even amongst a lot of vegans, are people who say, well, I'm a flexitarian, actually, I hate that, you know, I'm a flexible vegan. Peter Singer, I mean, you know, Peter Singer, father of the animal rights movement, um, our father says, 
um, you know, that, that I'm a flexible vegan. Well, then what the hell is it as a moral principle? If it's okay to eat, you know, if it's okay to have the Paris exception, when you're in Paris, you can sort of like, you know, have animal products or, or you know, if you, you know, if, you, if they're raised humane, humanely, whatever the hell that means, it's okay to, you know, I mean, he actually says that. You know, he actually says that, you know, um, that he can, you know, that he thinks that being a, 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 uh, uh, an eth a compassion, what's it, is it uh, ethical on the board or whatever it is, you know, that, that he, he thinks that that's a morally defensible position. So if people are taking that position, then it basically, it's like veganism becomes like eating cage-free eggs or eating, you know, organic, you know, this or, you know, happy this or happy that. It's just one of a number of ways of reducing suffering. But in fact, um, if we had, if we had in 1985, promoted veganism as a principle of justice, not a way of reducing suffering alone, but a way of, but a way of thinking about justice that we owe to non-human animals, we'd have a different playing field right now, and we wouldn't have the disgusting fat. Every time I go to Whole Foods and I walk past that that meat aisle and I see, you know. Humane uh, animal welfare rating this, animal welfare rating that, and I have some kid tell me, "Oh, but it's really okay, Mister. You know, because PETA gave us an award as being the best animal friendly retailer." You know, and and I mean, I mean, for two years they had that letter on their website that Singer had sent. They had on the Whole Foods website, you could see that the whole, the entire animal movement was basically, you know, patting them on the back. So that's, I think, that's a that's a dead end. That's that's a bad scene. That's never going to go anywhere. Grassroots. That's what we need. What we need are the young people who are skeptical of organizations. These are these are you know, a lot of these a lot of these young people are into anarchism. I mean, they're they're basically they're skeptical, healthfully skeptical, I might add, of political nonsense. They look at the political system and they say it is nonsense they look at these organizations and say this is big business and these people are coming over in drugs I mean they're, they're basically not participating in that, that scene anymore and what they're doing is they're going out on weekends and they're doing stuff like like uh, with the, um, Hannah like you know Hannah was standing there at the table when I when I walked in and she's standing there and she's got this stuff from Grindcore which was the last thing I did in Philadelphia actually it was a, I did I did a, a reading on one of the books I wrote um, at, at Grindcore and, um, and she had the stuff from Grindcore. So like, she's handing out samples of stuff so people can see that being a vegan doesn't mean you're like eating styrofoam. You know, that in fact, you know, it's really tasty. And, and so there are young people going out every weekend and they're going to like local street fairs in their, in, their, in their cities and in their countries. And they're standing there and they're passing out. Rather than giving money to these multi-zillion dollar organizations, they're taking their money and they're producing vegan food and they're handing people samples and they're giving people literature. On the website that, 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 um, that was up originally, we've got an abolitionist approach to animal rights uh, a, a pamphlet that you can print out. Um, and we got it in 21 different languages, you know? Now, you know, I mean, some of those things were translated by people I don't know that well, so for all I know, you know, it says, you know, in, in Slovakian, eat meat. I don't know. But, but you know, I, I assume they were acting in good faith. And, and we've got, you know, we've, got, we've now got people in Kenya who have started, you know, we've now got a group in Kenya that's doing, like, you know, that's, that's doing uh, grassroots um, activism and stuff. That's how you change the world, by getting people in their communities, talking to people in their communities, and educating people. And this multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. And the reason I keep doing it is every week, I, I said to Anna, I said, I'll stop when the first week I have fewer than 20 people writing to me from different parts of the globe saying, you know, I was a vegetarian for 20 years. It never occurred to me I had to go vegan. Now I'm going vegan. Or, you know, I had somebody write to me this morning who said, as a result, you know, I, that, that she read the book, and she's now been talking to people, and she now feels she's got a structure to talk to people, and she's gotten five people in the past two months to go vegan. And as long as I keep getting emails like that, I'm going to keep doing it, because that's how you change things. And we could have had that 10% now instead of the, the anemic, ridiculous, counterproductive, happy exploitation movement that is brought to us by these large organizations. Okay. Um, uh, man, I'm back of you. What's your name? Hey Steve. I have two questions. Yeah. First one is for farm animals, that's like domestication. Yeah. The veganism truly like falls into place. Where do let's say cows and chickens find their place back in the ecosystem? Well they won't. They won't. They won't. No. Because we just they they're produced they're produced on a cycle 
in order for us to consume them. If you stop buying them, they will not be bred. So just as, as the street outside is not, there are tons of ex-carriage horses, you know, that went wild at the turn of the last century, um, they're just not produced anymore. They're, they're, they're created for a domestic demand. And obviously, if, if suddenly um, we all went vegan overnight, that's what people think that we're suggesting, um, then you'd have to take care of the ones that are here. But just a bit, um, then you'd have the stray cow problem rather than the stray dog problem. But they will just stop being produced. Just the way that, that breeding is manipulated, depending on the price of corn, or if um, you've got a, a local disease problem, or if you've got a, a, a change in, in taste and demand. They're not going to produce animals that nobody wants to buy. And these are not natural. I mean, look, these animals have been domesticated to be totally dependent on us. They're not like it's not. It's not like you know that that the the ecosystem will be diminished by their non-existence. As a matter of fact, the ecosystem is being destroyed because of their existence. And so, um, you, you know, we're not, as Anna says, we're not going to all go vegan overnight. If we all woke up tomorrow and we were vegans, we would be a different. We would be different. Beings, and we would presumably be much more serious about nonviolence, and we'd be much more serious about ethics. And so we would then say, okay, fine, we've got a moral obligation to take care of the animals who are here now, but um, we, you know, but we shouldn't bring any more into existence. Um, so you know, that's that's what would happen. I mean, you know, and look, let me tell you, there is, and, and I'll take, let me let me, I'll push you to the logical conclusion, just so you're not wondering, you know, three hours from now, what would he have said to the following? I will tell you what he said. <laughs> You will never meet anybody on the planet Earth who loves hanging out with dogs and interacting with dogs as much as I do. I love our dogs. I just adore them, um, and they are my whole, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're just my world. If there were two animals, two dogs left, and it were up to me whether they continued to breed so that we could have pets, the answer is not on your life. And, I mean, I do not, I mean, I love my dogs, but you know what? They're, they're sad. They're animals that are bred to be totally dependent on me. They're dependent on me for when they eat, when they sleep. When I mean, it's like they they live in this nether world of vulnerability that you know it's like they're not animals and they're not humans and they're these sorts of creatures that are totally dependent. I think it's really very sad, you know. And so and I think domestication is wrong. I think you know we ought to live with our species. They ought to live in the wild. We ought to leave them alone, and and just you know I mean you know we ought to stop interfering you know uh, 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 with. With, with their, you know, we gotta, we gotta stop encroaching on them, we gotta leave them alone, um, but the bottom line is, I can't justify domestication, I can't. And the second thing is, what about eating insects? How does that fall into veganism in large Well, I don't eat them, but, um, <laughs> uh, although, you know, I... I mean, there's been talk about feeding these sort of vegan insects and where people come to them. And yeah, and I don't know whether insects are sentient, um, that is, I don't know whether they're subjectively aware. I don't know if they feel pain. I think, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, there's different, different people have different views on that. I don't kill them. Um, uh, and and, um, and when I don't walk on grass, actually. Um, whenever I can avoid it, I will, I will go way the hell out of my way to not walk on grass because I don't want to kill anything. But um, I don't know whether they're sentient. Um, and um, uh, if they aren't sentient, then it wouldn't bother me whether we ate them, although I suspect that they probably are sentient, and um, and I don't think that any I don't think we're gonna s look. The bottom line is, why do we have to kill anything? I mean, and this, it just comes from this idea that we have to have animal protein. It's so we, if we if we were so if we we're willing to get over the squeamishness and revulsion that most people feel that the idea of eating insects, perhaps some people don't feel that, but I think the majority would, particularly in this society. Um, if we were willing to get over that because of the necessity about eating animal protein, wouldn't it be just easier just to get some education and a bit of uh, changing our viewpoints so that those chickpeas and those uh, kidney beans look really good? I mean, one of the reasons why I don't eat, like people say, well, you know, what do you think of Beyond Meat, you know, this new fake meat that's out? And, and the answer is, I don't eat that stuff. I mean, if, you, I mean, if, that, if that turns you on, that's great, but I, I don't eat it because I don't like being reminded 
of the fact that for 28 years of my life, I actually ate that stuff. And, and, and I don't like, you know, somebody says, oh, gee, it tastes really like chicken. That makes me want to puke, frankly. I mean, it's like I don't find it attractive to be eating flesh anymore. And, and, and I also, I, I mean, look, if people like to eat that stuff. It's certainly better than eating the meat. But, um, but my view is, is that why do we have to always think that meat, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, God, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to be vegan, so I've got to have some replacement, you know, for the sausage and the turkey and the hamburgers and all that stuff. And the answer is stop thinking about them as things to eat. It's the same reason, like, somebody says to me, well, you know, I've got rescue chicken. Should I eat the eggs? And the answer is no. You've got to get away from the idea that, a, you know, that animal things are things to eat. We've got to get away from them. First of all, there are other reasons why, because it, you know, when hens lay on fertilized eggs, they will generally eat them themselves to, to get to, to, to replenish the, 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 the calcium deletion, the mineral deletion they get from making the egg. But, you know, and, and, and also, you know, where do the chickens come from? And, you know, and, 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 you know are, you, are you buying them? How do they die? You know, et cetera. There are all sorts of issues. But the bottom line is, like, we don't need, you know, I mean, 32 years, you know, I have been, I have not had an animal product in my body for 32 years. And I got news, I mean, I really, it's, it's okay, really, you can live. You know, you can live, you can be fine. You know, as a matter of fact, you want to come up, I'll arm wrestle you. And, and, and um, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, it, it's okay, you can survive. And so you just got to get away from this idea that animal, animal products are things to eat. And, and so we're so used to that. But you know, look, most of the stuff that's really bad, we're used to. Like, we don't even see sexism. I mean, we, we, this, we te Anna and I teach a course at Rutgers called um, uh, Human and Animal Rights. And we do racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, and speciesism. And, and what's really interesting is like, you know, we, 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 when we did the sexism stuff, the, the whole theme of it was sexism is so pervasive, we don't even notice it. You know, it's like, it's like we don't even know, we don't, we, if somebody says, well, what would it be like to live in a non-sexist society? The answer is, wow, I don't even know what the hell, I, I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to live in a non-sexist society because sexism is so pervasive. And the structures of sexism, you know, the, the structures that, that, that privilege patriarchy, are so incredibly deep, dense, pervasive, and ubiquitous that we don't even recognize them. So, so like all the bad stuff is stuff that like, you know, is like all around us. It's like air. We don't even notice it. That's the stuff we got to be really careful about, you know? It's like, it's like racism, you know, if you equate racism with the Ku Klux Klan, well, you know, if you, you know, if you, when you, if you can identify somebody who's like wearing a little hat and running around with costumes and burning crosses and stuff, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, those are racist people. The problem is the rest of us <laughs> who don't think we're racist, but who have been raised as white people in a society of white privilege, so that racism is, I mean, the fact that we can sit around and have discussions about whether or not there's systematic discrimination against people of color. When I hear people have that, too, when I hear people say, well, you know, is it really clear that we discriminate any longer? It's like, I just want to, I want to cry. Because I want to say, what, what planet do you live on? You know, of course, you know, I mean, to be white is to have been raised in a structure of privilege where whiteness is privileged and color is 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 not. And and so I think that you know the animal stuff for me it's part of you know that's the other thing one of the other things that sort of um, differentiates my work from um, others is I make a central focus of my work um, the idea that that. This is all violence, and it's all wrong. It's all part. It's, it's discrimination, and all discrimination is violence. We just have to get rid of it. We just have to. We have to get rid of it, and and um, and it's pervasive, and we have to sort of be critical about it. And so, you know, uh, when we talk about animals, and we start. We call them its, for example. You know, it sort of like says something. It says like you know, it's the locution of thingness. Um, and so we need to be. We need to be focused on that. But um, you know, and 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 so I do think that um, you know, look. Race, what's racism? It's, it's excluding people from the moral community on the basis of race. You know, what's sexism? It's, it's, you know, it's, it's like you can't be a member of the, of, the, of the moral community, a full member of the moral community because of, of sex or gender. Um, and, you know, and what's speciesism? It's like you know, you, you're excluded from the moral community because of your species. It's just nonsense. It's nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. It can't be justified. And, and, and I've never, 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 ever heard a good argument f for any of that stuff. No, nothing. No, no, no. Uh, yes, what's your name? My name is Chris. Hi, Chris. You were talking about moral animals, whether or not animals and people with mental 
disabilities have moral attitudes, I guess it was. No, no, whether they have moral obligations to us. In other words, if, can I sensibly say, if somebody's mentally disabled, really seriously mentally disabled, and that person harms me, can I say, well, if that person has acted in an immoral way, I can say that I don't like what the person's done to me, but, mm -hmm. but if somebody can't really understand where it's like they have moral obligations, um, I, I can't hold them responsible, which is why, for example, you know, we don't. I mean, we oftentimes don't hold people responsible criminally, for example, um, if, they, if they aren't able to, um, you know, if they aren't able to... Uh, They have to be really, really messed up because I know a lot of people that have had, you know, that felt that they were more than responsible and they were mentally disabled. And I know some people, a couple of animals, think they were that way. Okay.